emergency has been reported in this building. Please cease operations and leave the building utilizing the nearest exit or fire exit stairway. Good day everyone! Let us talk about life safety systems in buildings focused on fire in buildings. Objectives Identify, describe, distinguish between passive and active fire protection. Identify, describe, distinguish, and interpret fire resistance and spread fire ratings. Name, describe, and distinguish between types and key components of building fire extinguishing, sprinkle and stand pipe systems, fire detection systems, and fire alarm. But before that, let us first define what is fire. Fire is a combustion reaction that requires oxygen or air, heat, and a fuel. Typically, a spark or flame ignites the fire beginning the combustion reaction. In order for the combustion to continue, there must be sufficient heat given off by the reaction and a proper blend of oxygen and fuel. The rate at which a fire burns is dependent on the composition of the fuel, the surface area of the fuel, the rate at which fuel absorbs heat, and the amount of oxygen that is present. Different fuels ignite at different temperature. First is piloted ignition temperature. It is the temperature at which a fire can start when a flame or spark begins the combustion reaction. In here, the fuel is hot enough that it releases sufficient flammable gases for combustion to occur, but a catalyst is needed to begin ignition. Second is auto-ignition temperature or sometimes called the spontaneous ignition temperature. It is the lowest temperature at which a combustible material ignites in air without a spark or flame. It often occurs in piles of oily rugs, green hay, dust, leaves, or coal. It can constitute a serious fire hazard. Progression of Fire There are four stages in the progression of fire. First is ignition, second is flame spread, third is flash over, and last is consumption. The first stage of any fire starts with ignition of a fuel source. It requires proper blend of oxygen or air, heat, and a fuel. The second stage is flame spread, which is the characteristic of rapid crawling tongues of fire that leak across the surface of wall, ceilings, floors, and supporting timbers. The nature and combustibility of the material govern the speed and intensity of flame spread. As fire intensifies, the heated material releases large volumes of volatile gases into the air. When the mixture of gases and air reach critical proportions, the material ignites in a great ball of fire called the flashover stage. During this stage, the fire might reach explosive proportions. The final stage in the burning sequence is the fiery consumption of the material itself as it burns to ash. Classifications of fire Generally, fires are classified into four groups by type of fuel. Group A or ordinary combustibles, such as wood, paper, plastics, trash, and grass. Group B, flammable liquids, such as gasoline, oil, grease, and acetone. Group C, electrical equipment, such as any electrical wiring, connection, and equipment. Group D, combustible metals, such as potassium sodium, aluminum, and magnesium. Performance of materials in a fire Building materials exposed to high temperatures in fire can fail rapidly. Structural collapse from high temperature is a real safety concern in buildings. So these are the common materials used in buildings. 
their performance in fire varies significantly. First material is steel. Steel is a non-combustible material, yet it displays a significant loss in strength at high temperature. Structural steel loses about half of its strength at a temperature of about 950 degrees Fahrenheit or 510 degrees Celsius. At temperatures of about 1350 degrees Fahrenheit or 730 degrees Celsius, steel loses about 90% of its strength. As a result, structural steel is typically protected from fire by an insulating layer of fire-resisting material. A fire-resisting material limits temperature rise of steel in a fire to keep it from losing strength. Some light materials such as gypsum plaster and wallboard are effective as fire protection of steel. Second material is lumber and timber. Wood is a good insulator. But when it is exposed to fire at temperature as low as 300 degree Fahrenheit or 150 degree Celsius, it will burn until it is destroyed. Wood loses strength by charring in a fire. The penetration of surface charring of wood surface in a fire is fairly consistent with time. It is estimated that the depth of char in wood surfaces exposed to the standard endurance test temperature is about 1.5 inch or 37.5 mm per hour or about 1 over 40 of an inch per minute. Third material is fired clay masonry. Brick and other fired clay products are vitrified in a kiln or oven at high temperatures during their manufacture. As a result, fired clay masonry units are relatively stable in a fire endurance test. Brick also displays reasonably good thermal performance. One of the more significant factors in the fire endurance of hollow brick masonry is the amount of solid material in the wall thickness. Hollow clay masonry units having thin face shells and webs are subject to stresses resulting from an evenly distributed thermal expansion. The tendency to spalling and shattering has been observed in hollow clay tiles. Fourth material is concrete. Concrete, which is similar to brick in thermal performance, loses strength gradually during exposure to high temperature. It retains about half of its original strength at 950 degree Fahrenheit or 510 degree Celsius and one-third of its original strength at about 1,300 degree Fahrenheit or 700 degree Celsius. This loss in strength is irreversible because it is from the deterioration of the cement binder and in some cases, degradation of the aggregate. The fire endurance properties of concrete depend on the type of aggregate, the proportions of the concrete mix, and moisture content at time of fire exposure. Concrete composed of limestone aggregate displays generally favorable performance in fire, whereas some quartz and granite aggregates used in concrete have a tendency to spall when exposed to high temperatures. There are two factors to be taken into account in assessing the fire endurance of reinforced concrete. One is the thickness of concrete required to limit the temperature rise on the unexposed surface to 250 degrees Fahrenheit for the period desired. The other is the cover required to keep the temperature of the reinforced steel below that at which it will lose its effective strength. Building Construction Types There are five fundamental categories of building construction. First is Fire-Resistive Type 1 Construction Fire-Resistive Type 1 Construction with its concrete and protective steel walls, floors, and structural framework was initially intended to confine a fire by its method of construction. That is, by containing the fire with non-combustible wall ceiling and floor assemblies, so it is confined to one floor or one space on a floor. 
However, fire dust is spread several floors in a modern fire system building through two paths. First is duct work in the central heating, ventilating, and air conditioning or HVAC system. And the other is flames extending vertically from window to window. HVAC system Air ducts delivering air to the interior spaces in the central HVAC system go through walls, floors, partitions, and ceilings. They penetrate fire barriers and fire separation. Fire or hot gases in a room near a fresh air intake or return air duct will be sucked into the duct system and be blown throughout the structure if the system continues to operate. Therefore, the first action taken in a burning fire system building should be to shut down the HVAC air system. Vertical spread of flames from windows below to windows above. Flames erupt erupting out of a heat shattered window can break or melt glass in a window directly above. Once a window above is open, flames can enter and ignite combustible ceiling tile, walls, hanging, or furnishings. Second is non-combustible type 2 construction. Non-combustible type 2 construction is also built of non-combustible steel or concrete walls, floors, and structural framework. However, the roof covering is combustible which can burn and spread fire. The roof covering of a Type 2 building can be constructed of a combustible build-up roof covering, a layered asphalt and felt paper covering, or an ethylene propylene DIN monomer EPDM or polyvinyl nichloride PVC thermoplastic membrane. When a fire occurs inside a Type 2 building, flames can rise to the underside of the steel roof deck conduct heat through metal and ignite the combustible roof covering. The asphalt, felt paper, and foam insulation may burn and spread fire along the roof covering. Third is Ordinary Type 3 Construction. Ordinary Type 3 Construction is built of non-combustible masonry bearing walls but the floors Structural framework and roof can be made of wood or another combustible material. The major recurring fire spread problem with Type 3 construction is concealed spaces and penetration. These small voids, cavities, and openings through which smoke and fire can spread are found behind the partition walls, floors, and ceilings. Wood studs, floor joists, and suspended ceilings created concealed spaces. Fire spreads inside concealed spaces of a type 3 building by convection, or the transfer of heat by motion of a liquid or gas. Heated fire gases and flames in a concealed spaces can travel upward several floors and break out in an attic space, engulfing the entire building envelope. Fourth is heavy timber type 4 construction. In this type of construction, a wood column cannot be less than 8 inch thick in any dimension and a wood beam cannot be less than 6 inch thick. The floor and roof decking can be thick wood planks. Exposed timber beams, columns, and decks, if ignited in a fire, create large radiated heat waves after the windows break during a blaze. If a fire in a heavy timber building is not extinguished by the initial firefighting attack, a tremendous fire with flames shooting out of the windows will spread fire to adjoining buildings by radiated heat. A fully involved Type 4 building requires large water supply sources to protect nearby buildings. Fifth is Wood Frame Type 5 Construction. Wood frame type 5 construction is the most combustible of the five types of building construction. A wood frame building is the only one of the five types of construction that has combustible exterior walls. 
The interior framing and exterior walls are typically constructed of slender, repetitive wood studs, joists, rafters, and trusses that burn very rapidly. Flames can spread out a window and then along the outside wood walls in addition to the interior fire spread. A Type 5 building is rapidly engulfed in flame and is therefore reserved for small structures with small occupancies. Passive Fire Protection Passive fire protection in buildings involves constructing walls, floors, ceilings, beams, columns, and shaft enclosures so they can resist, control, and contain the damaging effects of a fire. It is intended to entail the following. Provide structural and thermal integrity of floor, wall, and ceiling assemblies during a fire for a specified time period. Compartmentalize a room or space to control the fire spread. And provide exiting systems for occupants to safely and rapidly evacuate the building. If well designed and maintained properly, passive fire protection systems are extremely effective in protecting building occupants and controlling the spread of fire. Fire Resistive Construction A principal objective of fire resistive construction is to use materials and construction assemblies that contain the fire in a small area and confine the fire in the room or area for a specific period of time. Fire resistive construction provides protection for a specific time period so building occupants can be made aware of the fire. The occupants can be evacuated from the building and firefighters can fight the fire. A good example of a building that was suitably compartmented against the spread of fire is the Empire State Building. In 1945, an aircraft hit the 78th and 79th stories and a severe fire involving large quantities of fuel broke out. Despite the severity of the fire, there were no casualties among the many occupants of the floors both above and below the fire area. A factor that plays a great role in reducing the overall fire risk in a building is the extent to which fire resistant construction is used to divide a building into fire resisting compartments that will contain a fire and prevent its propagation to neighboring compartments. Compartmentalizing means separating a building into compartments so that if there is a fire, the fire damage is confined to a certain room or a certain section of the building only. Firewalls or fire rated walls that form a required barrier to restrict the spread of fire throughout the building. They serve as a means of dividing a large structure into compartments. Firewalls are normally built of brick, concrete, or masonry. Typically, a firewall must extend from the foundation and intersect a non-combustible roof surface or extend beyond the roof by a specified vertical distance, usually 32 inches. A fire separation is similar to a firewall, except that it does not extend from the foundation to the roof assembly. It is used to divide different occupancies in a building, example, a garage from a residence or enclosed exit corridors and stairs. A shaft wall is a protective fire rated enclosure around an elevator hoistway or mechanical chase. A fire stop is a specific construction technique consisting of all materials that fill the opening around penetrating items such as cables, cable trays, conduits, ducts, and pipes and their means of support through the wall or floor to prevent the spread of fire. Several site-applied fire protective coverings Insulations and coatings can be used to insulate structural members from the effects of high temperatures generated in fire. Gypsum wallboard is a fire protective covering that consists of approximately 21% water chemically bonded to calcium sulfate. In a fire, a large amount of energy is released to evaporate water in the gypsum material 
giving it excellent fire protective qualities. Insulating materials include rock wool or fibrous insulation made from volcanic rock and vermiculite, a natural insulating material, also functions well. The performance of these insulations is dependent on the thickness. A thicker material provides greater fire resistance. Concrete and masonry also serve well as fire protective coverings. An intomiscent material swells, enlarges, inflates, and expands when exposed to heat. These intomiscent coatings expand approximately 15 to 30 times their volume when exposed to high temperatures in a fire and thus provide a good fire protective barrier. Intomiscent materials perform well as a fire step to sealing penetrations through fire separation. Fire doors are typically of steel or solid wood construction and are installed with specially tested components including closers, latching hardware, and fire-rated glass lights or windows. Fire-resistant glass can be classified in two categories, insulating and transmitting glass. Fire-resistant heat-transmitting glass contains flames and inflammable gas for a short period of time but does not prevent the transmission of heat to the other side of the glazing. Fire-resistant insulating glass, on the other hand, contains flames and inflammable gas for a longer period of time and prevents not only the transmission of flames and smoke, but also of heat to the other side of glazing. Another common way for fire to spread from one compartment to another is through the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning ductwork. Fire dampers automatically close to obstruct smoke and fire from a building blaze. Fire dampers are installed in the plane of the firewall to protect these openings. Upon detection of heat, the fusible link melts, closing the fire damper blades and blocking the flame from penetrating the partition into the adjoining compartment. Smoke dampers close upon detection of smoke, preventing the circulation of air and smoke through a duct or a ventilation opening. Several fire and smoke ratings are used to classify the behavior and performance in a fire. A fire resistance rating, expressed in hours or minutes, is a measure of fire endurance, the elapsed time during which a material or assembly continues to exhibit fire resistance under specified conditions. It is assigned to building assemblies based on results from laboratory testing that determine their ability to withstand the effects of a fire for a period of time. An assembly meeting the 1-hour exposure in the standard fire test receives a 1-hour rating. An assembly meeting the 2-hour exposure receives a 2-hour rating and so forth. Fire resistance ratings of selected construction assemblies are summarized in Table 21.2. The fire resistance rating is determined in the standard fire endurance test such as the method is specified in ASTM E119 or the standard methods of fire test of building construction and material. This test method evaluates how long a construction assembly will contain a fire and how long it will retain its structural integrity during a predetermined fire exposure. Other tests include ASTM E152 or the fire test of door assemblies and ASTM E163 or the fire test of window assemblies. The ASTM E119 test of floor and roof assemblies is conducted using a furnace with horizontal dimensions of approximately 13 feet by 17 feet. Another common measure used to evaluate the performance of a material in a fire is its flame spread. 
The flame spread rating describes the surface burning characteristics of a building material. The most widely accepted flame spread classification system is specified in the National Fire Protection Association Life Safety Code NFPA No. 101. The NFPA Life Safety Code primarily applies this flame spread ratings classification to interior wall and ceiling finish materials. The flame spread rating is expressed as a number on a continuous scale where inorganic reinforced cement board is zero and the red oak is 100. The scale is divided into three classes. The NFPA Life Safety Code groups the following classes in accordance with their flame spread and smoke development based on classes A, B, and C. Class A or 1 with a flame spread rating of 0 to 25 has good resistance to flame spread. Class B or 2 with a flame spread 26 to 75 has a fair resistance to flame spread. Class C or 3 with a flame spread rating of 76 to 200 has a poor resistance to flame spread. Flame spread ratings and classifications for common materials are found in Table 21.3. In general, inorganic materials such as brick or tile are Class A or 1 materials. Reconstituted wood materials such as plywood, particle board, and hardboard are Class C or 3. Although different species of wood differ in their surface burning rates, most wood products have a flame spread rating less than 200 and are considered Class C or 3 material. A few species have a flame spread index is slightly less than 75 and qualify as Class B or 2 materials. Flame spread ratings and classifications for common materials are provided in Table 21.3 and 21.4. The Smoke Develop Rating is a single number classification of a building material as determined by an ASTM E84 test of its surface burning characteristics. It is expressed as a ratio of the smoke emitted by a burning material to the smoke emitted by the red oak standard material. Active Fire Protection and Suppression Active fire protection systems includes standpipe, sprinkler, and spray systems. Its purpose is to extinguish the fire outright or control the fire by delaying its damaging effects. It is extremely effective in containing and fighting a fire if they are designed and maintained so they work properly. This requires regular inspection, testing and maintenance. Poor maintenance leads to a false sense of security and lack of proper protection when the system is needed under an emergency situation. The types of firefighting media are water, foams, inert gases, and chemical powders. Standpipe systems is an internal piping network connected to fire hose stations that are used to rapidly suppress a fire. It is placed where it may be difficult for the fire department to adequately pump water on the fire and can be manually discharged through hoses. Piping runs vertically, up and down, and horizontally, side to side, throughout the building. Risers, stand pipes running vertically, are located in staircase enclosures or in the hallways in the building. It supplies water to every floor in the building. At selected locations in the building, the stand pipe is connected to a hose. Hose is usually stored on the quick release rack called a hose reel. Fire hose and reel stations are strategically positioned throughout the building. Gate valves control these connections. The gate valve is manually opened to open flow to the hose, nozzle is attached at the end of the hose. It is used to direct the stream of water from the hose. The hose and nozzle must be easy to reach at all times. House outlets are located so that every part of the building may be reached with a hose stream. The maximum length of a single hose line is 125 feet sometimes the hoses are installed in cabinets. If the hose is installed in a cabinet, it must be labeled fire hose. A standpipe system may be combined with an automatic fire protection system. The standpipe and the sprinkler systems may even share the same water supply and riser piping. The top of the standpipe riser extends up onto the roof. 
Hose connections are attached to the top of the standpipe riser. These three connections make up the roof manifold. The roof manifold is used when extinguishing fires on the roof. It is also used when testing the water flow in the standpipe. Types of standpipe systems Wet standpipe It is most commonly used standpipe system. It is used in heated buildings where there is no danger of the water in the piping freezing. Any part of the standpipe system that is exposed to freezing temperatures should be insulated. It is very important that the water in the piping does not freeze. Frozen water may prevent a standpipe system from working. Dry standpipe with an automatic dry pipe valve. This system is usually supplied by a public water main. Under normal conditions there is no water in the piping. Instead, there is air under pressure in the piping. A dry pipe valve is installed to prevent water from entering the standpipe system. The dry pipe valve is designed to open when there is drop of air pressure in the standpipe. When a hose is opened it causes a drop in air pressure in the standpipe system. Then the dry pipe valve automatically lets water flow into the standpipe. A control valve is installed at the automatic water supply connection. This valve should be kept open at all times to supply the standpipe system. This system is usually installed in a building that is not heated. Dry standpipe with a manual control valve. This system is supplied by a public water main. Under normal conditions this system has no water in the piping. The water is not allowed into the standpipe until a control valve is manually operated. The control valve remains closed until a fire occurs. This system is usually used in a building that is not heated. Dry standpipe with no permanent water supply. Under normal conditions, this system has no water in the piping. Water is pumped into the standpipe system by the local fire department. The water is pumped in through the Siamese connection. This system cannot be used unless water is supplied by the fire department. A sign must be attached to each of the hose outlets. It should read dry standpipe for fire department use only. This system is usually used in a building that is not heated. Classes of standpipes systems Standpipe systems are classified depending on who is expected to use the system. Class 1. This system is designed for use by professional firefighters. The fire hoses in these systems are 2 and 1 half inches in diameter. The large hose diameter makes it difficult to control the stream of water from the hose. Class 2. This system is designed for use by the occupants of a building. The hose and nozzle are connected to the standpipe. They are ready to be used by occupants in case of a fire. The hose is 1 and 1 half inches in diameter. The hose stream is easier to control than the class I hose. Class 3. This system may be used by either professional firefighters or by occupants of the building. The hosing may be adjusted to either 1 and 1 half or 2 and 1 half inches in diameter. Attaching special reducing valves to the hose line does this. Active Fire Protection Systems Installation of automatic fire suppression systems could save hundreds of lives annually, prevent thousands of injuries, and eliminate hundreds of millions of dollars in property losses each year. Fire suppression systems are intended to extinguish or control a fire. These include automatic water sprinkler systems and systems that use a gas agent or foam to eliminate oxygen and suffocate the fire. Smoke control systems are designed to limit the spread of smoke to maintain passable occupant egress routes for a given period of time and to aid firefighters in fighting the fire. Automatic fire protection system provides a warning to occupants of the building, notifies emergency personnel responding to the alarm, and activates fire suppression systems to reduce the growth rate of a fire or the movement of smoke. Smoke detectors sense the presence of fire in the building. The fire control panel then sounds an alarm, shuts down air handling equipment, disconnects power from the protected equipment, and then releases agent into the protected area. Conventional Automatic Sprinkler Systems Automatic sprinkler system consists of the sprinkler heads and a network of pipes placed in a horizontal pattern near the ceiling. It is designed to automatically dispense water on a fire and to extinguish the fire entirely, or to prevent the spread of the fire. Conventional sprinkler system is fitted with automatic devices designed to release water on a fire, 
Sprinkler heads. The rise to a predetermined temperature causes the sprinkler head to open. The sprinkler heads are fitted at standard intervals on the piping. If more than one head opens, the area sprayed by each overlaps that of the sprinkler head next to it. Approved automatic sprinkler system is installed in accordance with fire or building codes. It uses the proper automatic sprinkler heads for the structure's occupancy and construction, has an adequate and reliable supply of water, has been tested, and has been found acceptable to the appropriate governmental authority. Types of Conventional Automatic Sprinkler Systems 1. Wet Pipe Automatic Sprinkler Systems have pressurized water in the pipe and mains. Because of the potential for freezing, this system is suitable for buildings where the indoor ambient temperature is not lower than about 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. In wet systems exposed to freezing temperatures, pipes containing an antifreeze solution of water glycerin or water propylene glycol are connected to a water supply. The antifreeze solution, followed by water, discharges from sprinkler heads opened by a fire. This type of system is used in locations subject to freezing. Use of antifreeze solutions is limited because they are costly and are difficult to maintain. 2. Dry pipe automatic sprinkler systems have pipes filled with compressed air or nitrogen. The pressure is slightly above the water pressure, and this pressure difference is what keeps the water out of the sprinkler lines. When the sprinkler head is activated, the air will begin to be released and the air pressure will drop. As air pressure drops, water will begin to advance throughout the lines and flow through the activated heads. The dry pipe type is typically used in unheated buildings where there is danger that the water in the pipes would freeze and burst the pipes. 3. Pre-action automatic sprinkler systems The water first fills the pipe as an alarm is set off, providing an opportunity to extinguish the fire manually before the sprinklers open. Water is stopped at feeders by a valve. This valve is activated by a heat detecting device within the area, and a signal is sent to the valve and the valve opens. Water will then flow to all heads, but will only discharge through the activated heads. If there is an accidental break of a sprinkler line, water will not immediately discharge because the valve is holding back the water flow and not the sprinkler heads. The pre-action sprinkler system is often used where the use of sprinklers could cause extensive material or equipment damage, such as in retail stores and computer areas. 4. Deluge automatic sprinkler systems allow all sprinkler heads to go off at the same time and all sprinkler heads open. Once a heat detecting device activates the valve, water will flow from all heads within the area. Deluge systems are generally installed in hazardous areas where extremely rapid fire spread is anticipated and that requires immediate application of water. Automatic sprinklers are devices that open automatically to discharge water when an excessive temperature is detected. Each sprinkler is typically individually heat activated. The system works immediately upon sensing excessive temperature to prevent the fast developing fires of intense heat, which are capable of trapping and killing building occupants. Sprinkler Heads 1. Metal. They are screwed into the piping at standard intervals. Water contained within the system is prevented from leaving the sprinkler head by an arrangement of levers and links. The levers and links are soldered together on the sprinkler head. 2. Quartz bulb. Expands and breaks under heat. 3. Solid chemical. Held in a cylinder that is broken by heat action. 4. Cycling sprinkler. This sprinkler head cycles water on and off depending on the temperature. When the disc temperature cools, the valve closes to shut off the water. Mauve or purple solutions in the bulb will activate at 340 degrees Fahrenheit or 171 degrees Celsius, and are rarely used, they are indicative of a very high hazard sprinkler classification. Sprinkler heads exposed to corrosive conditions are often covered with a protective coat of wax or lead. Corrosive vapors are likely to make automatic sprinklers inoperative or slow down the speed of operation. They can also seriously block the spray nozzles in the sprinkler heads. They can damage, weaken, or destroy the delicate parts of the sprinkler heads. In most cases such corrosive action takes place over a long time so sprinkler heads must be carefully monitored for signs of corrosion. Sprinkler Operation and Layout 
In conventional systems, individual fire sprinklers are spaced throughout the ceiling of a building at predetermined intervals or positions. Most sprinklers have a 1 half inches discharge opening. Each sprinkler can cover approximately 100 square feet. Pendant type hangs below the pipes. This allows the piping to be concealed above the suspended ceilings with only the pendant head showing. Upright head set on top of the pipe and the entire system is exposed to view. They are commonly used in warehouses and in retrofitting older buildings. Sidewall sprinklers are often used in small rooms where they can throw a spray of water across the entire room. In this manner, only one sprinkler is needed in the room. Once activated, conventional sprinklers continue to run until the main valve is manually closed. This can result in excessive water damage, one of the major causes of property loss in fires. Flow control sprinklers close automatically once the ceiling temperatures are reduced. Many of these sprinkler heads are reactivated if the temperature goes back up. They are not designed for use in dry pipe systems. Regardless of the type of sprinkler head, they must be replaced after they have been activated. Types of pipe approved for use include the following. Steel pipe are approved for use in all fire suppression sprinkler applications. Threaded unflanged connections are used to join pipes and fittings. Specialty compression strap type fittings, called victolic couplings, make system installation easier. Copper tubing is the most popular water supply pipe material, but it is used less frequently in fire sprinkler systems. The thin walls of copper tubing are usually soldered to fittings. Chlorinated polyvinyl chloride CPVC, is a rigid plastic pipe generally approved for use in fire suppression sprinkler systems in residential and many light commercial applications. Solvent cement welding threaded, and flanged connections are used to join CPVC pipe and fittings. CPVC pipe and fittings for fire sprinkler systems are orange in color. Alarm and control valves. An alarm valve and gate valve serve to control flow in the network of sprinkler system. The alarm valve initiates an alarm signal when water flows through the sprinkler system. The gate valve opens or closes flow to the system. It should be maintained in the open position at all times. Large buildings must be protected by multiple sprinkler systems, each having an alarm valve and gate valve. Operation of the control valves can be accomplished by the automatic fire alarm system by provision of valve tamper switches that will initiate a trouble or supervisory signal at the fire alarm control panel to indicate closed valve. If this type of monitoring cannot be provided, the valves should be locked in the open position. Primary Sources of Water Supply Water for automatic sprinkler and standpipe systems must be available in sufficient quantity and at sufficient volume and pressure at all times to ensure reliable operation in the event of fire. Potential sources of water supply for sprinkler and standpipe systems include a direct connection to the public water system, gravity tank, pressure tank, or automatic fire pump. Where a municipal water supply cannot meet flow and pressure requirements, a reservoir or storage tank must be provided to provide a secure water supply. A gravity storage tank may be located on the top of a building or on a tall tower. The water in the tank is distributed throughout the sprinkler or standpipe system by the force of gravity. Pressure tanks are often used where there is enough water from a supply source, but the water pressure is too low or in tall buildings that need the extra water pressure to supply the highest line of sprinklers or the highest line of hoses. A fire pump is a part of a fire sprinkler system's water supply in high-rise installations where the local public water system cannot provide sufficient pressure, where systems require high pressure at the fire sprinkler in order to flow a large volume of water, large warehouse or manufacturing plant, and where water is from a storage tank. Supplementary Sources of Water Supply Supplementary sources of water supply for sprinkler and standpipe systems include manually or automatically activated fire pumps or Siamese connections. Tanks used to provide the required primary water supply to a standpipe system may also be used as a supply for an automatic sprinkler system.
A Siamese connection is a Y-shaped inlet connection for fire department use in supplementing or supplying water for stand pipes and sprinkler systems. Backflow and backflow prevention Fire sprinkler systems must have backflow prevention capabilities installed to protect the public or private potable water distribution systems from backflow of water. Typically, a double check valve assembly DCVA, or a reduced pressure backflow prevention assembly RBPA, is required in residential, commercial, and industrial installations. The backflow prevention assembly should be properly maintained, inspected, and tested annually by a licensed fire sprinkler contractor. Alternative Fire Suppression Systems Water Mist Automatic Sprinkler Systems It relies upon a fine spray of water to suppress a fire. The mist, with its small droplets of water, is very efficient in absorbing a large amount of heat as the droplets contact the fire and is converted to steam. The optimum water droplet size ranges from 0.003 to 0.005 in, 80 to 200 meters, although larger droplet sizes can be used. This system is only permitted in a small number of applications. Approved applications include general machinery spaces and gas turbine enclosures. Clean Agent Gas Fire Suppression Systems It discharge as a gas on the surface of combusting materials. Clean agent gases can be released in a building space without leaving residue. When released, they extinguish the fire rapidly but do little harm to building occupants, firefighters, interior contents, and equipment. Typical installations often protected by clean agent gas fire suppression include art and historical collections, computer rooms, data processing centers, telecommunications centers, telephone switching rooms, electrical switchgear and transformer closets, vaults, tape storage areas, and raised floor spaces. Carbon Dioxide CO2, Fire Suppression Systems it discharge a CO2 gas that extinguishes fire by displacing oxygen or taking oxygen away from the fire. CO2 is also very cold as it comes out of the extinguisher, so it also cools the fuel. The principal problem with CO2 is that it must be used in fairly high concentrations. As a result, it is usually used in confined areas such as mechanical chases, unventilated areas, and display cases. Foam Fire Suppression Systems It discharge a high volume of gas-filled bubbles that rapidly fill a space. They float on the surface of burning liquids to deplete oxygen and smother the fire. Foam is very effective on flammable liquid fires and most popular in areas where flammable fuel is likely to be, such as airplane or jet hangers. Automatic Sprinkler Testing and Maintenance after installation of an active fire protection system is completed and approved, fire codes generally require a certificate from the contractor indicating that the system was installed in compliance with the code and that all of the required tests were performed. Systems are typically hydrostatically tested at a pressure of at least 200 pounds per square inch, 1380 kilopascals, which is well above street pressure. Active fire protection systems must be well maintained to ensure reliability. Periodic testing and maintenance is essential to ensuring that a fire protection system will work as intended in a fire situation. Influence on building design The presence of an automatic fire sprinkler system and or smoke control installation influences the allowable size and configuration of a building because it extends the distance an occupant can travel when exiting the building. Typically, the maximum distance of travel from any point to an exterior exit door, horizontal exit, exit passageway, or an enclosed stairway in a facility, building, or structure not equipped with an automatic fire sprinkler system should not exceed 150 feet This distance is extended 200 feet in a facility, building, or structure equipped with an automatic fire sprinkler system installation throughout. In a single-story factory, warehouse, or airplane hangar, the exit travel distance may typically be increased to 400 feet if the building is equipped with an automatic fire sprinkler system installation throughout and provided with an approved smoke control installation. In an open parking garage, the exit travel distance may be increased to 250 feet with these installations. Automatic Sprinkler Systems in Residences 
A residential sprinkler system typically uses a half-inch orifice standard sprinkler, with a maximum of 256 feet squared .8 square meters, coverage, and a 25 GPM .6 liters per meter, flow rate. If the system is not supplied by an adequate public water source, a 250 gallons .3 liters, stored water supply is rack wired to provide a 10 minutes water supply. Sprinklers are required in living rooms, bedrooms, or kitchen areas, but not required in bathrooms 40 feet square, 3.7 square meters, or less, small closets, 24 feet squared, 2.2 square meters, or less, attics not used as a living space, porches, carports, garages, and foyers. A multi-purpose residential fire sprinkler system combines the domestic potable cold water system with the residential fire sprinkler system. It uses the cold water piping to serve as a supply for both the domestic fixtures, i.e. sinks, showers, and so on, and the fire sprinklers. Portable Fire Extinguishers Classifications of Extinguishers Class A extinguishers are suitable for use on fires in ordinary combustibles such as wood, paper, rubber, trash, and many plastics, where a quenching cooling effect is required. The numeral indicates the relative fire extinguishing effectiveness of each unit. Class A extinguishers are rated from 1A to 40A. A discussion on the numbering system follows, extinguishers rated for Class A hazards are water, foam, and multi-purpose dry chemical types. Class B extinguishers are suitable for use on fires in flammable liquids, gases, and greases, where an oxygen exclusion or flame interruption effect is essential. Class B extinguishers are rated from 1B to 640B. A discussion follows, extinguishers rated for Class B hazards are foam, halon alternative, and CO2 and multi-purpose dry chemical. Class C extinguishers are suitable for use on fires involving energized electrical equipment and wiring where the dielectric conductivity of the extinguishing agent is of importance. FO Our example, water solution extinguishers cannot be used on electrical fires because water conducts electricity and the operator could receive a shock from energized electrical equipment via the water. Class D extinguishers are suitable for use on fires in combustible metals such as magnesium, titanium, zirconium, sodium, and potassium. No numeral is used for Class D extinguishers, the relative effectiveness of these extinguishers for use on specific combustible metal fires is detailed on the extinguisher nameplate. Common Types of Fire Extinguishers Air Pressurized Water APW, extinguishers are large, silver tanks filled about two-thirds water, and then pressurized with air. An APW is a giant squirt gun that stands about 2 feet tall and weighs approximately 25 pounds when full. They are designed for Class A fires only, solid combustible materials that are not metals such as wood, paper, cloth, trash, and plastics. Carbon Dioxide Fire Extinguishers Carbon Dioxide CO2, fire extinguishers are filled with non-flammable carbon dioxide gas under extreme pressure. They are designed for Class B and C fires only, flammable liquid and electrical. CO2 is a gas that extinguishes fire by displacing oxygen. CO2 may be ineffective at extinguishing Class A fires because they may not be able to displace enough oxygen to successfully put the fire out. CO2 extinguishers are used in laboratories, mechanical rooms, kitchens, and flammable liquid storage areas. Dry Chemical Fire Extinguishers Dry chemical fire extinguishers put out fire by coating the fuel with a thin layer of dust, separating the fuel from oxygen in the air. The powder also works to interrupt the chemical reaction of fire, so these extinguishers are extremely effective at putting out fire. Dry chemical extinguishers come in a variety of types. ABC indicates that they are designed to extinguish Class A, B, and C fires, BC indicates that they are designed to extinguish Class B and C fires. Fire Extinguisher Location Portable fire extinguishers must be strategically situated. They must be located so the travel distance is not more than 75 feet for Class A and Class D hazard areas, 
and not more than 50 feet for Class B hazard areas. Extinguishers must be located close to the likely hazards, but not so close that they would be damaged slash isolated by the fire. If possible, they should be located along normal paths of egress from the building. Where highly combustible material is stored in small rooms or enclosed space, extinguishers should be located outside the door and never inside where they might become inaccessible. Extinguishers must not be blocked or hidden by stock, material, or machines. They should be located or hung where they will not be damaged by trucks, cranes, and harmful operations, or corroded by chemical processes, and where they will not obstruct tiles or injure passers-by. All extinguisher locations should be made conspicuous. Also, large signs can be posted directing attention to extinguishers. Extinguishers should be kept clean and should not be painted in any way that could camouflage them or obscure labels and markings. Smoke Control Systems A smoke control system is an engineered system that uses mechanical fans to produce air flows and pressure differences across smoke barriers to limit and direct smoke movement. It is the part of a fire protection system that manages and directs smoke to protect building occupants and property, both the building and its contents. This system can also be used to assist firefighting activities. Let's talk about fire detection and alarm systems. Fire alarm systems. Fire alarm systems detect products of combustion such as smoke, heat and light and provide early occupant notification to allow the safe egress of the occupants. Smoke Alarms It is a smoke detector and alarm in one unit. They typically use an audible alarm signal to alert and warn building occupants of a fire. Smoke alarms are typically used in single-family homes, multi-family dwelling, and in some instances, light commercial applications. Smoke and Heat Detectors A smoke detector is a sensing device that identifies products of combustion in air. Heat detectors are a sensing device that recognizes a high temperature or a rapid increase in temperature. Types of Smoke and Heat Detectors Fixed Temperature Heat Detectors Fixed temperature heat detector signal an alarm after the temperature at the detector reaches a set value. A number of fixed temperature designs are available, including what follows. Fusible alloy, bimetallic detectors, electrical conductivity detectors, heat sensitive cable detectors, liquid expansion detectors. Rate of rise heat detectors. Rate of rise heat detector signal an alarm when the temperature at the detector increases at a rate exceeding a present value. Pneumatic rate of rise detectors have an air chamber with a diaphragm enclosing a portion of the chamber. Electrical conductivity rate of rise detectors have a sensing element that changes its resistance with a change in temperature. It is connected to control equipment and sends an alarm when the rate of temperature increase exceeds a preset value. These detectors respond to temperature changes. If the temperature changes slowly over time, this type of detector will not detect a fire. Rate of rise detectors can, in many cases, detect fires more quickly than fixed temperature detectors because of the length of time it takes for temperatures at the detector to reach that of fixed temperature detectors. Flame Detectors Flame detectors sense specific wavelength ranges of ultraviolet or infrared radiation and send an alarm signal. Although radiation travels in a straight line path, either reflector will detect reflected ultraviolet or infrared radiation off of wall, floor, ceiling, surfaces. Ionization Smoke Detectors Ionization smoke detectors are designed with a sensing chamber that has a radioactive element. Smoke particles entering the sensing chamber change the electrical balance of the air. The greater the amount of smoke, the higher the electrical imbalance. 
Ionization smoke detectors respond first to fast flaming fires because these fires produce invisible particles that less than 1 micron in size. They respond less quickly to smoldering fires that tend to generate larger particles. Photoelectric smoke detectors Photoelectric smoke detectors use a light scattering or light obscuration principle. When smoke particles enter this chamber, they interfere with the beam and scatter the light. When a preset level of light strikes the photodiode, the alarm is activated. Air sampling smoke detectors Air sampling smoke detectors use a similar approach to light obscuration detectors. However, a laser or xenon tube is typically used as a light source. Manual Pull Stations Manual pull stations are lever-like devices mounted on a wall or pole in strategic places in the building and that are connected to a building fire alarm control panel or directly to the municipal or district fire alarm system. Alarms The most common method of alerting occupants during a fire emergency is an audible evacuation signal delivered through bells, horns, shims, buzzers, and sirens. Strobe lights are also used in combination with the audible signal to ensure that hearing-impaired occupants recognize the need to evacuate. Newer systems use voice commands to direct the occupants to evacuate the building. Emergency Voice Communication Systems an emergency voice communication system provides pre-programmed recorded messages that offer direction, instructions, and a calming voice in an emergency situation. Fire Detection and Alarm Systems In medium-large buildings and building complexes, a fire detection and alarm system includes all or some of the following. A system control unit a primary or main electrical power supply, a secondary power supply, usually batteries or an emergency generator, alarm initiating devices such as automatic fire detectors, manual pull stations, and or sprinkler systems flow devices connected to initiating circuits of the system control unit, alarm indicating devices, ancillary controls, such as ventilation shutdown functions connected to output circuits of the system control unit, remote alarm indication to an external response location such as the fire department, control circuits to activate a fire protection system or smoke control system. The fire system control unit serves as the center of the fire alarm system. The fire alarm control panel is the central part of a fire detection alarm network in schools, municipal buildings, nursing homes, hospitals, apartment buildings, warehouses, office buildings, retail malls, and department stores. In large buildings, there are several fire system control units. A fire command center is a remote panel or set of panels connected to the fire system control panels. The command center contains the following. Voice fire alarm system panels and controls. Fire department two-way communication service panels. Telephone for outside communications. Sprinkle valve and water flow status panels. Smoke management controls. Elevator Collocation Status Panels and Annunciators Fire Pump Status Panels Emergency Generator Status Panels